Inspelningen är startad. Och Sådär. Då ska vi se här. Okay, hello and most welcome to 14.43. And please uh, give me notice if the sound volume is not good or if I should keep the microphone closer to me. And this is a test recording. So I already uh, apologize for problems here it's trying to see where is the best place to record uh, we talked in 1442 about differences and oppositions And Derrida speaks of the irreducible ambiguity of the Greek logos. This is a quote from the second paragraph on page 79, 81, sorry. Are we Jews? Are we Greeks? And the point there is everything is consisting of oppositions even unity is composed of opposition so without oppositions there can be no true unity and preemptively trying to get rid of unity or get rid of differences and oppositions will rid us of the chance of unity. And as Hans Rehn writes, in Paul, we have the idea of both the inclusion of differences and the transcendence of all difference. So the zest of it is without taking in the differences, we cannot transcend them. And nota bene, this is not the dialectical move of Hegel, very far from it. This is rather an understanding that difference is an integral part of wholeness. Even foundational. So I continue here my readout, and we are at the very last paragraph on page 81.
From our reading of Nietzsche and Heidegger as key philosophical predecessors. and also as paradigmatic philosophical readers of Paul. We can thus begin to sense a territory where Paul can be situated in the word work of Derrida. as both an important background, but also as a critical contrast. My comment here, this last one is crucial. program of deconstruction is connected to a Pauline sense of time and history as articulated by Heidegger with an inspiration from Kierkegaard. But as such, it is also connected to the question of what it means to stand within and at the same time rebel against a tradition. to questions of belonging, inclusion, and exclusion, to the alternatives of revolution and restoration. I will not reread the last one, but an important point is made here. And inclusion and exclusion and belonging are, so to speak, alternatives to the ongoing present mode of functioning of turning over and then restore revolution and restoration. Right. 
So this inclusion of differences makes the violent upheavals we experienced smoother. The constant upheaval and tries at settling, restore. And this is a repetition of what was mentioned in the previous lecture of taking indifferences, oppositions will cause permanence will make permanence a possibility. I wouldn't say it's an inculation or a vaccination against the dreadfully violent turmoil that has plagued modern history, but it is bound to make it less grotesque, less drastic. And the examples of how we previously gone with these things are numerous disasters, revolutions that have cost billions of lives and terrible wars that are much, much more gruesome than they ever were before. And this very modern lack of wholeness, it leads people either to fundamentalism in the reductionism or the perceived opposite of relativism or postmodernism. Those two latter things are actually the same. Trying to preserve essence, RK, makes them constantly oscillating. Not understanding the valleys and the hills of what we earlier called yin and yang and absence and fullness, that is permanence.
I will get back to this most interesting wholeness difference idea later in the summary, but I will now read the next chapter or subchapter, which is Darida on religion. Continuing the text and presently on page 82 of Hans Ruin's article. Nietzsche and Heidegger do not only provide two distinct and at least on the surface fundamentally incompatible ways of approaching Paul. against Nietzsche's uncompromising critique of Paul as a cunning spiritual seducer stands Heidegger, Heidegger's attempt, it should be with an S, to reinstate Paul as a kind of proto-existentialist thinker of temporality and historicity. My comment here, we earlier mentioned temporality as a very difficult aspect of Heidegger. Historicity is Geschichte in contrast to Historia. You can see it as what really took place, regardless of what we observed or what is noted down in print. Also in relation to religion in general, Nietzsche and Heidegger could seem to represent two extremes.
Whereas, whereas Nietzsche anticipates Freud in his attempt to discharge the religious impulse at its root. by portraying it as a kind of malady of the soul. Heidegger appears instead to seek a secular philosophical articulation of the religious and the sacred. That's so funny. <laughs> Hello. through an, a thinking of being as event and as gift. in a way that comes to the fore even more in his later writings. My personal comment here, and this is from me, is that I've seen Heidegger as taking in both the secular and the sacred to make it a bigger wholeness. But that is my take. Where does Derrida belong on this territory? In the earlier writings, there is little talk of religion. Thank you. 
generally Derrida was perceived as an atheist thinker with no religious commitment or agenda. In a recent and much debated study by Martin Heglund, deconstruction is even labeled as a radical atheism. Implying that its conception of difference finitude and critique of metaphysics even commits it to a radically non-confessional standpoint. This particular book, however, was written as an explicit attempt to criticize a strong tendency among some of Derrida's followers in recent years. precisely to re-engage in a discussion with theology and religion. The starting point Oh, I saw a comment there. I'm sorry for the disappearance of the sound. I did not see it until now. We'll check it out closely. And as a comment to Henry, Henrik, please give your opinion of the sound quality disturbance and so forth. Thank you very much. Okay.
the starting point for this particular development and reorientation in deconstruction was a conference on religion that took place on the island of Capri in 1994. organized by Derrida and Gianni Vattimo. There he gave the talk, Faith and Knowledge, which was later published in the conference volume. This experimental and wide-ranging essay was to have an enormous importance for the rise of interest in religion in contemporary continental philosophy. Already at the time of its composition in the early 90s, there was much talk of a return to religion. Yes, you heard right. And this was also the explicit motivation behind the organizing of the meeting. <clears throat> Thank you. 
But what was new in Derrida's approach was his way of reaching again the question of faith and reason. as perhaps, and this is interesting, perhaps sharing a common source. And this, you can see now, my commentary, the similarity from my previous take. And let me repeat some of the phrases here. Derrida's approach was his way of breaching again the question of faith of and reason. And that we instead should think of faith and reason as perhaps sharing a common source this is a, my comment here is in sharp contrast to Hedenius for instance in Sweden and this is the inclusiveness of opposites And I would say healing the distinction between faith and reason. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. We can do something about the sound. In the essay, Darida declares his commitment to an enlightenment tradition. And a good part of his discussion is concerned with Kant and his 79, 1792 essay, Religion Within the Boundary of mere reason. And I have to ask uh, the listeners, is it worth continue with this disappearance of sound? Or is it still understandable? You can leave your comments. Maria. 
but partly through a meditation on the very metaphor of the enlightenment. The light and the shining. He shows how we as enlightened have also already committed ourselves to a space where, listen now, shining and appearing takes place. And thus in the vicinity of the religious. And I would say Hans Rehn here makes an incredibly strong point. Enlightenment is, and I think I said that before, the religious practice of the idea of light, of absolute clarity. Bring it out into the open and put it onto a fluorescent light, the strongest you can find. And then you will meet the truth with a big T. And I would say that tendency is plaguing us today even more. We are simply not aware that we are subjective perceiver. And I would say even that majority of people think what they say is absolutely clear and logical and in some way true. They do not understand that there is an observer and thereby, as Rudolf Gachet would have it, nullify all their opinions, making them into dust.
Consequently, a central point of the analysis is that faith is not restricted to the sphere of religion, but signifies a more general comportment that also manifests itself in rationality. Derrida also identifies what he takes to be two principal sources of the religious, namely the messianic or a messianicity without messianism. And the Chora, as a name from Plato, designating when an organism fails to recognize itself and develops immunity in relation to its own tissue. So this, I think, should be compare my comment here to the concept of autopoiesis by Verala and Maturana. But here we have a, an immunity to its own tissue. For Derrida, autoimmunity can also take on a more general cultural significance.
For Derrida, autoimmunity can also take on a more general cultural significance. In a later interview, he describes it as when a living being in a quasi suicidal fashion itself works to destroy its own protection. To immunize itself against its own immunity. He's here describing an autoimmune disease like, for instance, psoriasis or allergy. Cold. Autoimmunity auto movements are what produce, invent, and feed the very monstrosity they claim to overcome. This model is, is then used to interpret the inner dynamic of both secularist and theist discourses that tend to produce precisely their own destructive counterparts. Very good, Hans Rehn. This is what they exactly are doing. My comment here, look at the Enlightenment movement as a reinstatement of religious mythology or one-eyedness. Sheer light as the only way of reaching understanding. And the modern take, the only way to truth today is 
distinction, definition, and absolute clarity. All has to come out into the open. Nothing is implicit. In the essay, Faith and Reason, Derrida refers to Paul only in passing and then to give recognition to Nietzsche's critique of the Apostle, as already quoted earlier. But in its general orientation, it is nevertheless much closer to Heidegger's approach in its overall method than to the Nietzschean genealogical critique. It seeks to show how deconstruction and its form of interpretation and critique can in fact be used to open up a discussion about issues that are normally relegated to matters of faith. Very good once more. And my comment here, do keep a close eye to the next couple of lines. They are very important. by questioning the very distinction between the secular and the religious. It outlines a new discursive space. a kind of middle ground 
similar to Heidegger's methodological neutrality. In his early lectures, In the introductory remarks to the essay, Derrida also recalls the shared background for many of the people who had gathered for the seminar, namely a broadly understood phenomenological inheritance. This is absolutely crucial. And it's almost too big to understand directly, but let me give you some pointers here. Think about dividing the discourse into logos and mythos. And how this distinction, as Derrida has shown so many times, cannot be upheld, that implicitly points to them both coming from a greater wholeness. And only, only, only then, when we reach this greater wholeness, can we make any sense at all. So this is uh, two flies with one stone. It kills off atheism and a, a possible apologetic movement showing that they are reinforcing their own limits, causing an autoimmune reaction within themselves by the, what they think are arguments. by checking in both, uh, or rather understanding that there is no distinction to be seen, that the distinction is in itself something founded in an argument of sorts. It's a Gödelian inconsistency, incoherent idea that what I said or say or will say could be eradicated from mythos or religion, nor could it be eradicated from rationality, neither. Rather, they are inherently codependent as stemming from a similar or same source. I'm just going to put a marker here in my paper so I know where I am. Just give me a second here.
I will read another paragraph, make a summary of this most interesting part of the text. And you're also most welcome to put some questions. I, I will not be able to hear you much clear, so please put them in writing if it's possible. The impact and importance of this essay for the subsequent development of a kind of deconstructive turn in theology has been monumental. It has been most visibly elaborated by scholars such as Hente Fries, John Caputo, and Susan Sherwood, who have all published extensively on Derrida. and religion but who have also tried to make use of this theoretical orientation to open new avenues for contemporary theology. Jennings' aforementioned book belongs to some extent to this whole movement. as it tries to make use of Derrida and deconstruction for a new interpretation of Paul and his legacy of the present, in the present. Now to my Short summary, my hands are getting dead cold. It's rather humid here. But remember how we looked into space in earlier lectures. And that absence has a constitutive role in what makes up existence object. Now move that over to knowledge 
understanding itself and that understanding my way of understanding also have contradictions or absences that are constitutive of what makes up thinking, what makes up understanding. The turn since the enlightenment is a trying to make one's understanding in a way dense, complete, without holes or contradictions. The very idea of blanking out opposition within one's own thinking makes it into an autoimmune movement. What you think you are doing when you are clearing your mind or sharpening your argument, which is very modern, is actually obliterating the force that only contradictions could give. I would say this is the incredibly sharp and it obliterates, of course, Ingmar Hedenius' famous Swedish book, Tro och vetande. The very understanding itself, the modus, if you like, or the stimmung, is taken into consideration. How do I understand something? Not the content of my understanding, what I can repeat to you as I speak here. No. But in what way I keep it? Do I keep it by contradiction or do I try to make it non-contradictory consistent, coherent, in a Gudelian move. This is great by Hans Rehn because the modus of understanding is never addressed within modern education. This is only something taken up by the threesome of Heidegger, Derrida and Wittgenstein. If it is ignored, it leads to the nullification of what one is thinking, of what one is argumenting for or against. It makes it less 
energetic, less functioning, less forceful, less telling. It is this undermining tendency that is pointed to here. Let me repeat one of the better quotes here last paragraph at the end of page 83. For Derrida, autoimmunity can also take on a more general cultural significance. In a later interview, he describes it as when a living being in a quasi-suicidal fashion itself works to destroy its own protection, to immunize itself against its own immunity. This could be paralleled to weakening one's own understanding unknowingly and by force of historicity, simply by not knowing what makes a permanent, strong thinking argument, or more clearly, an understanding. See, do we have any questions? You're more, more than welcome to put any questions if you want to know. Let's see here. <laughs> Very good. It's a question from Kalle Lundahl. How does autoimmunity relate to the di dichotomy faith and reason? In the take of enlightenment, they want to read their own argument, their thinking, their understanding of dichotomies. Such as the dichotomy faith and reason or untruth and truth, they want to make it and let me put this example. If you are an enlightenment philosopher like Kant, you would like to put everything within the boundary of reason and cast out faith. Derrida is pointing to that in that case, Kant is attacking himself his own stability and protection because all arguments, all thinking are already based on dichotomies. As we said in the beginning of the lecture, 
The idea here presented is to take in differences, oppositions, and thereby strengthening one's own arguments. If you go the other way, you try to get rid of the oppositions, of the dichotomies in your own understanding. You do the Gedalian twist, the Gedalian approach. You will attack your own thinking, your own protection and stability. And this is very close to how an autoimmune disease like psoriasis work. It sort of tries to get rid of dichotomies within the body. Things that are perceived to be in opposition, not proper body parts or good members of the body and attacks them, trying to make the body, well, let's say consistent and coherent. Unbeknownst to the person or its system, but known to others that look at the person who suffers from psoriasis, they will see that he is weakening himself. The system is weakening the person, but he himself does not know it. That is important. And that is transcending, accepting the differences, the oppositions, and thereby transcending them, taking them in. Allowing them will make, and this is, I think this is the most important, allowing mythology, untruth, will make your rationality even stronger. You will not weaken it. And this is so similar to autoimmune diseases. And uh, I think I mentioned, not in the lectures, but how allergy turn, allergies turned up in the beginning of the 19th century, 20th century, sorry, because they try to take away dirt, bacteria, and so forth too much. They did not realize that a healthy autoimmune system is consisting of oppositions and thereby they weaken the system. Yeah, exactly. I see now, Kalle. He needs the healthy poison of faith to make his rationality and faith stronger. So even if he only opts, let's say can't say he want to evict all faith, he needs to bring faith into himself. And also think about the hills and the valleys. Without the valleys, the yin, there will be no hill quite literally, quite literally. We, we can look into history and 
I think most, most his, historians know that the Enlightenment had their downfalls. But what we don't know, this is still a specter of phantasm that haunts us. And I would say even more by putting space in between us and the Enlightenment and thinking that we can understand without bringing in oppositions or considering them. Do not confuse this with humbleness. Because it has, of course, uh, an aspect of humbleness. It has an aspect of being less egotistical, but in this text, that is not the most important aspect that Hans Rehn is pointing towards, but it has those aspects as well. Will make you stronger to take in oppositions. And we are today suffering from a disaster of autoimmune diseases. And I would say that is not a coincidence with what Hans Rehn and Derrida, Heidegger, and previously Wittgenstein has mentioned. They do go hand in hand, not understanding contradictions within, only fearing bacteria or putting into the system in your mental state that need, these bacteria needs to be evicted. That, I am quite certain, will cause the seed of an autoimmune disease. No point from Henry. Henry, are you with us? At least maybe you can comment on the sound quality. Uh, sound, the sound is okay. Sound is okay. Tror du får skriva? I think you have to write, Henry. Hmm. Not much of disturbances then. How odd. Well, that's good news. I will make the lecture, and this is beside uh, the point for you who are listening to the this lecture. I will make the lecture tonight soundproof. But it's good that I can have this place as well, since here I have unlimited access, unlimited gigabytes. Well, I think I have to, yes. Yes, indeed. Let us be grateful to Hans Rehn for his analysis of Derrida's 1994 essay, Faith and Reason, which helps to unpack Hedinius. Definitely. Well, very kind, Kalle. And thank you for listening and for your patience in this not perfect environment at all. And I will listen to uh, how the sound disappear and sort of try to judge how bad it is, this flexing Wi-Fi. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a very pleasant afternoon. Bye-bye for now. I need to stop sharing. And I end.